And I want to just back off and want you to think about what if somebody asked you that question? How would you respond? Well, I can tell you I sent up a prayer and then I launched in. I said, what do you think causes the most suffering in the world? Is it our fists, our weapons, or our words? He reflected a moment and he said, our words, the spoken and the unspoken. That was a profound answer. So I said, for our God to keep us from hurting each other, he would have to control our words. And to control our words, he must control what creates our words. He must control our thoughts. We fight world wars to prevent such oppression. You were alive when a man named Hitler wanted to control people's thoughts. How would you like a God like that? I saw his eyes widen as he considered that. He stared at me because he had been through that war in Denmark. At last he said, I see what you mean. Yes, I would rather be free. Years ago, I attended a funeral of a much-loved two-year-old son, a close friend of mine, a designer for Insight Magazine. His friend, my friend, had found his son uh, floating face down in a pond. The funeral service seemed especially tragic. I remember thinking the, the coffin is too small. One other thought loomed during the service because a pastor leaned on the pulpit, looked out over a sea of tears, and he said, we must recognize that whatever happens is God's will. When I heard those words, I was on the platform. I had prayer. I wanted to stand up and shout, no, this is not God's will, not my God. We need to distinguish between what God allows and what God desires. Second letter of Peter says, God is not willing that any should perish, but people perish. I got an answer to this one day sitting with my son Jeffrey. When he was five years old, he and I were eating Cheerios, breakfast of champions. No, that's Wheaties. I think you have different champions here anyway. He was five, and we were discussing why he couldn't go over to his friend Clayton's house to play right now. And Jeffrey became pensive, Jeffrey, who's now the pastor. Dad, he said, looking at me, God doesn't always get his way either, does he? Hmm. From the mouths of babes. My eyes missed it over a little when I replied, no, son, he doesn't. Not everything that happens is as our omnipotent God would have it. He doesn't get his way because his way is also the way of freedom. Freedom is sacred to God. God would rather have us free than have us safe. God would rather have us free than have us saved. That's how important it is to God. Otherwise, he would force us to be saved, to be gentle, to be unselfish and kind. He will not do that. Freedom is sacred to God. God knows love cannot be forced. We can compare God's situation to Yolanda's and my purchase of our present house. When we bought the house, we did so with the idea that it would be a center of love for our family, a place of warmth and light, a sanctuary for companionship, security, and honor. But with the house, we also purchased something else, a lifetime of poverty. <laughs> we purchased a mortgage. You call it mortgage here? Yeah. The bank actually owns our house. And we must make payments to the bank. 
Now, I have to be very clear with you on this. It is not our desire to make those payments. <laughs> we would rather not. But the mortgage comes with the house. For God, the house he has bought is freedom. Human free will. And the mortgage payments on the house right now are suffering. That result from free choices. For now, Satan, who's called the ruler of this world, is the bank. Those of you who are bankers, I apologize. <laughs> but Jesus said, don't be afraid, for I have overcome the world. There will come a time when Jesus will buy back the bank. What do we do with all sorts of things that go on? One time Yolanda and I were looking at uh, a lightning storm as it raged outside. And we were marveling at it. Oh, isn't it pretty? Until we heard a loud clap and sizzling race through our house. Wow! Well, upon inspection, we found that one light bulb, the television, and the VCR were gone. Now, some of you might say, with the television, that was obviously from God. <laughs> the next day, I called the store where we had pur purchased the television because our service contract was still in effect. I'm not sure how it works here, but this is how it works there. The representative coolly informed me, Lightning strikes are not covered. You want to know why? It's an act of God. <laughs> I paused till I said, he gets blamed for a lot of things, doesn't he? <laughs> yes, he does, sir, she said. Understandably, we become confused. Christians play, thank you, pray, thank you, God, for this nice day, the sunshine, the needed rain, we're saying God controls the weather. He's also then apparently in charge of flooding in the Midwestern states of the United States. He's in charge of Bay of Bengal typhoons, droughts in Eastern Africa that starve millions, killer quakes in China. It's hard to love a God like that. Is it merely a matter of unfortunate positioning? A grain of sand is beautiful until it gets in your eye. Sometimes I read newspaper accounts of tragedies where some people are killed and some are spared. And a tearful survivor says, God saved my family. And I think about the people who lost loved ones. What do the grieving think of God when they read those words? We need to be careful about how we characterize God. If God saved theirs, they're thinking, then he killed mine. Apparently God didn't want my loved ones saved. Even when God is praised, he often inde indirectly takes the blame. I don't think we're doing him a favor to make such pronouncements often. We understand that God does intervene, does save, does Keep us safe from all alarms, as we sang here in the church. But sometimes it's better if we keep those to ourselves and share them with each other and not to the grieving masses. Columnist Ann Landers writes, a provocative dialogue. Sometimes I would like to ask God why he allows poverty, famine,